Thanks, everyone. Again, I'm Sylvia Miller, Senior Program Manager for Scholarly Publishing and Special Projects at the Franklin Humanities Institute here at Duke. Thank you for joining us this morning or afternoon or evening from wherever you are. Many thanks to our co-hosts, the Duke University Libraries and our co-sponsors, the Department of African and African American Studies and the Department of Art History and Visual Studies for spreading the word about this event. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Ranjana Kana, the director of the FHI to introduce our speakers. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ranjana or Ranji Kanna. I'm the director of the Franklin Humanities Institute and I'm really delighted to welcome you all here. Bookwatch has since 2004 been one of the Franklin Humanities Institute's signature events in which we collaborate with the library to celebrate the publication of a recent book and invite our colleagues, both local and distant, to come and engage with it. We would usually follow this up with a reception to celebrate our author. In this instance, we will have to postpone that, but there will be a follow-up event on April the 9th, a book watch part two, which will focus on Rick Powell's chapter from this book on Ollie Harrington um, uh, from, the, from the book that we are here to celebrate today. Going there, black visual satire that appeared from Yale University Press last year and that was originally given as the prestigious Richard D. Cohen lectures on African and African-American art at Harvard. Previous book watch events have been organized around books in reverse order by Sumathi Ramaswamy, Charlie Pio, David Morgan, Richard Broadhead, Timothy Tyson, Michelle Longino, Negal Motahede, Andrew Janiak, and Liz Mil with Liz Mil Milovich, Laurent Dubois, Roberto Dainotto, Srinivasa Ravamadan, Kate Hales, William Reddy, Carla Holloway, Michael Hart with Antonio Negri, The Volia Glimpf, J. Cameron Carter, Margaret Humphreys, Margaret Greer, Walter Mignolo, Maureen Quilligan, Toral Moy, Anne Allison, Barbara Hernstein Smith, and Kathy Davidson. Today, our respondents to Professor Powell's book will be Huey Copeland, Beverly McIver, Meta Dua Jones, and Marcus Wood, hopefully. He's, uh, we seem to be having some technical difficulties um, with Marcus, but hopefully he will be able to join us. And I will introduce each of them before they offer their comments. But let me begin by saying a little bit more about our colleague, Rick Powell. Professor Richard Powell is John Spencer Bassett Professor of Art and Art History at Duke, where he's taught since 1989. He studied at Morehouse College and Howard University before earning his doctorate in art history at Yale. Along with teaching courses in American art, the arts of the African diaspora and contemporary visual studies, he's written extensively on topics ranging from primitivism to postmodernism and of course portraiture, including such titles as Homecoming, The Art and Life of William H. Johnson from 1991, Black Art, the Magisterial and Encyclopedia, Encyclopedic, I should say, Black Art, A Cultural History, um, 1997 and uh, reissued, re, re, um, reissued in 2002, and Cutting a Figure, Fashioning Black Portraiture from 2008. He's the author of numerous books, including monographs and exhibition catalogues, and he's organized numerous art exhibitions, most notably The Blues Aesthetic, Black Culture and Modernism, 1989, Rhapsodies in Black, Art of the Harlem Renaissance, 1997, To Conserve a Legacy, American Art at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, 1999, Back to Black, Art Cinema and the Racial, Racial Imaginary, 2005, and Archibald Motley, Jazz Age Modernist, 2014. Among the major museums where his curated exhibitions have been presented are the Phillips Academy's Addison Gallery of American Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, 
the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the New Orleans Ma Museum of Art, London's Whitechapel Art Gallery, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. From 2007 to until 2010, he was the editor-in-chief of the Art Bulletin, the world's leading English language journal in art history. In 2013, he received the Lawrence A. Fleischmann Award for Scholarly Ex Excellence in the Field of American Art History from the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art, and in 2016, was honored at the College Art Association's annual conference as the year's most distinguished scholar. Establishing an ability to move swiftly and carefully between literature, theory, history, and the visual arts in Homecoming, his widely cited book, Cutting a Figure, calls for an empathetic reading of the portrait, one that acknowledges the subjectivity of both the viewer and the represented. Rick positions the practice of portraiture, portraiture as a performative act, one that is socially engaged and that makes evident the intersubjective relations that are inherent in the practice of portraiture. Powell's interests shift from the relationship established between the subject and viewer to that of the subject and the author of the image, as well as the historical context in which the image is viewed, an approach that makes an empathet empathetic and conscious reading of the images possible. Ranging over um, images from family albums to the new black portraiture, portraiture, portraiture of Kehinde Wiley to works by Barclay Hendricks and Mac Beverly McIver, he examines the ongoing ways in which portraiture and its shifting terrain has sh served to shape ideas of self and other within the politics of black representation. We're really excited to have this panel today on Rick's new book. Our first speaker today will be Huey Copeland. Uh, Huey is BFC Presidential Associate Professor in the History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. His interdisciplinary work explores African diasporic, American and European art from the late 18th century to the present, with an emphasis on articulations of blackness in the Western visual field. In particular, his research homes in on the vexed intersections of race and gender, subject and object, the aesthetic and its others from a black feminist perspective that aims to put pressure on the blind spots and conventions of modernist art history. Huey, thank you so much for coming today. Over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Ranji. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's truly an honor to be part of this discussion of Professor Powell's new book, not only because the work is so rich, but also because he has been a model and mentor for me and basically anyone worth their salt who is invested in shifting and expanding the grounds of African-American artistic discourse. So while I might wear any number of intellectual hats, thanks to my longstanding investments in queer and feminist black radical post-structuralist perspectives, I also write today as a fan. And in going there, Rick does not disappoint. In prose, as supple as it is subtle, he takes us on a fascinating journey through the 20th century that freshly illuminates the import and range of black approaches to visual satire. The third chapter on Robert Colescott is destined to become the go-to text on the artist's parodic self-construction. The second on the minstrel stain, along with the book's introduction, provides an indispensable remapping of so-called advanced 20th century arts, ambitions, and liabilities. And the first chapter, focused on the art of Ollie Harrington, is nothing less than a tour de force, which brings cartoons, 
their makers, and the public spheres that they addressed firmly into the African-American art historical orbit in a way not dissimilar to Rick's groundbreaking work on fashion as embodied by black supermodel Danielle Luna in his cutting a figure. There will, of course, be much more said on all of these scores this afternoon from this incredible group of panelists, which with whom I'm so pleased to share the stage. But per our brief, I want now to pose some questions for Rick and the group that going there brought up for me. First, given how the book deftly positions African-American cultural praxis in relation to a long history of Western satirical modes, might not we argue that black visual satire is part and parcel indeed integral to the singular critique of Western civilization that is, for Cedric Robinson, the project of Black study. Second, to riff on the words of Stuart Hall, what is this Black in Black visual satire? As the book's discussion of South African artist Zanelli Muhole's digitally darkened self-portraits makes clear, this Black is not solely African-American. So it'd be instructive to think with y'all about the implications of Rick's pioneering approach for reconsidering the kinds of articulation that resonate on the continent, in the Caribbean, and throughout the African diaspora, in addition to the Americas. Number three, Muholi is one of several queer artists engaged in the book. Can we think further about how the satirical allows us to explore, as Horton Spillers has shown, the ways that queering, with all the sense of failure and incompletion that it entails, is constitutively entangled with the operations of Blackness, and vice versa? Fourth, I'm keen to hear more about both the historical conditions and related cultural practices from which the book's key forms and figures took their measure. For instance, what were the black vernacular sources that mattered most to Colescott's emergent satirical voice and why? Alternatively, were there particular shifts in working class black women's employment and life prospects that spurred or abetted artist turns to the figure of Aunt Jemima in the 1960s? Finally, I found myself intrigued by the character of Rick Powell, who fleetingly appears, especially in the book's notes, as artist, witness, and interlocutor for many of the practices engaged. Since, as he so convincingly shows, Black visual satire depends on its viewers' inside knowledge for it to land, I'd love for Rick to go there with us in discussing how he came to be the savvy interpreter whose work we celebrate today. I look forward to the conversation and to Professor Powell's response. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I'm supposed to step in right now. <laughs> Can you all hear me? <laughs> and if you can hear me, then you probably hear my joy. <laughs> you can hear my pleasure. You can hear my, my, my sheer delight at, at what Professor Copeland has done <laughs> in this incredible, powerful, incisive walk through this book, but also questions that, um, that, that, that I hope we will be able to unpack in this very short time that we have. And I probably should have had my pen in hand, but I was so, I was just letting it wash all over me. So I, I had to put my hand down. <laughs> but, 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 but I will get to that last point first, because in some ways it does frame everything that we're gonna talk about. You know, Ranji, thank you again for that wonderful introduction. And, I, and if I had to add a little bit to it though, I would say that before I got my PhD in art history, I got my MA in African-American studies at Yale. Mm -hmm. And before I got my MA in African-American studies at Yale, I went to the College of, <laughs> of Blackness, <laughs> growing up in Chicago, Illinois on the South side of Chicago. Um, being in the midst of family and friends and 
colleagues and strangers who moved through the world um, in a particular way, spoke uh, in a very, very distinctive way that as I say in this book, I had to kind of get my satiracy um, in place. I had, to, I had to figure out, okay, now how, I just heard that, what does that mean? Or I just saw that. I mean, what, 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 what was that move? I saw that eyebrow raised. What was that eyebrow really raising for? <laughs> and the list goes on and on of, of, of both verbal and nonverbal um, discourse in the black world that, that I have always been a student of and I've always been fascinated with. And, and, and as you said, Ranji, I proceeded through academe Morehouse College, Howard University. And, and I'll just park there for a moment because being at historically black schools, one learns you know, how to read. <laughs> one learns, and I just don't mean reading in terms of you know, what's on the page, but you learn you know, the culture and you learn the ins and outs of, of how to operate, how to no negotiate, how to navigate you know, the world that you're in. And, and um, the book is dedicated to one of my professors at Howard at Morehouse College. Um, she now teaches at Spelman. She's still teaching. Her name is Gloria Wade Gales. She's a really important scholar of African American literature. But I remember being in her classes as a young student at Morehouse, and we're reading the classics. But we're also talking about culture. And it became clear to me that as we read the great Nella Larson or the great Richard Wright or the extraordinary James Baldwin or, or, or the incredible uh, Nikki Giovanni, uh, it became clear that, that there were the words on the page, but then there was this other undergirding sound and, and, and articulation and nuance that, that we had to open our ears up really, really wide to hear. And, and so all of this, uh, Professor Copeland, is kind of part of, of, of what lies behind this project. Yes, as, as I say at the beginning of the book, um, we did that show um, here at Duke where the painting, Lord, My Man's Leaving, just kind of discombobulated me because it discombobulated everybody else who saw it. And that was kind of the immediate kind of impetus for saying, okay, I'm gonna do a book on why this painting works. But, but, but then that adventure took me far beyond and it took me deep into the literature around um, satire that, that really in some ways was less about black satire, but more about how this discourse works in the wider world. But then I kept on bringing that back to, again, my world, my world of, of, of Chicago, my world of Durham, North Carolina, my world of, of engaging with, with, with black visual artists and, and, and the results are this project. Um, I could say more and I will say more, but um, again, I felt like a baptism with Professor Copeland. So I'm ready for some more baptism to flow over me through um, our incredible interlocutors, uh, Professor Jones and P Professor McKeever, and hopefully M Professor Wood will, 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 will appear soon and very soon. So I'm just gonna just take a pause. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, we, will, um, we will now go on to Meta Dua Jones. Um, and Meta, um, uh, um, if there are images, I should have said this to you as well, Huey, if there, if there are any images you want us to bring up, um, then just let us know, okay? Um, uh, Meta Dua Jones is Associate Professor in English and Comparative Literature at UNC Chapel Hill. Her creative scholarship focuses on African American literature and inter arts and has been published in diverse venues. Currently, she is working on Black Alchemy, a hybrid genre work of poetry, theory, and memoir that explores collaboration between writers and visual artists as they map memories of travel within the African diaspora. Meta, over to you. 
Great, thank you so much. I'd like to thank the Franklin Humanities Institute, you, uh, Ranji, uh, Sylvia, and Rick, uh, most especially for inviting me to join the throng. I'll go ahead and get started. Since you said mention the images, I'm going to share my screen to a slide that will show, and I'll jump forward to a particular slide. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, that shows which images I'd like us, uh, Rick, to pull up. Um, and it begins with some questions as well, and then I'll back up to other parts of my slide. Who or what is the satirical target? Rick's going there, ask us relentlessly in chapter after chapter after chapter. Who is the me in the audience that is being targeted? And who is the audience for going there? Who is the audience for the artists that Rick so brilliantly illuminates in this uh, book? So I'd like to make the case that one of the clues, the keywords, the code words, the core words, not only is there and going there as Rick Powell shows us to go, but titles, right? The titles that torque. And so the issue of understanding who the me is or the audience is in Rick's work, he argues sometimes comes only and solely from the title themselves. If we don't know the title of a work such as Jeff Donaldson's Aunt Jemima and the Pillsbury Doughboy, without the title, um, he argues in the book, we miss its satirical coding and referent. Um, if we don't know the title of listening to Amos and Andy, um, I would argue, then we miss here, which means we misrecognize many of the features that are layered textually in that particular um, acrylic on canvas work of art. If we miss here, or we speak too loud, or we shout it out over Beverly McIver's silence, then we miss the incisive critique of the ultra-violent, ultra-violet loudness of the minstrel stereotype of the watermelon. So I'm going to pause here because I think that these three works, it's, it jumped ahead to my Cinto, uh, Cinto, excuse me, these three works show us that seeing is hearing and hearing is disbelieving some of the kind of racist both orality, A-U-R-A-L-I-T-Y and orality in the work. So Rick, I'm gonna ask you if you can show those images and then I'm going to, um, after you do that, I'm gonna show a couple more images and then I'm gonna conclude with a cento that I've composed for Rick uh, for those poets in the audience know that comes from the book. It's carved completely. All the words in my Chinto when I read them come from Rick's words. So blame him, um, not me, if you get a little cut when you hear it. Okay, so first, um, Rick, I'll give you a minute to, do you want to pull the images up? And then I will, and then I'll continue. Meta, you'll need to stop sharing your slides. Oh, so he can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I've just stopped share and then we'll, we'll come back to it. Rick, do you need any help there? After, okay. I'm unmuted now. Okay. Okay. So did we, did we want to start with uh, Beverly's piece? We could start with Beverly's piece, most definitely. What we can do in the order, if we go backwards, that'd be perfect, actually. Because if we back into, I'll show you in a minute, if we back into Beverly's piece, Beverly's piece in its own way, I would, well, once you show you it, I'll do talk Jeff. about it. No, no, no. I want to do exactly what you suggest. We'll go from Beverly then we'll back um, up uh, to Robert Colescott and then we'll uh, do Jeff, uh, Jeff Lass. Okay. So is the question then seeing is hearing? And hearing is disbelieving. Um, I, yes, the question is seeing is hearing and hearing is disbelieving because you argue in the book, to, I, I don't know if you're showing, I, I don't think you're showing the image yet. But because oh, you, you argue, don't see it yet. No, we don't see it yet. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. 
If it's an issue, I can just finish my slides and then you can share at the end if that's your preference, Rick. It's up to I you. had it up, but for some reason it's not responding. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you can hear me, but you can't see me. Okay. Or you can, let's, uh, let me get out of it and get back in it. Okay. Okay. Let's see if I can get it again. Okay. Don't y'all love technology? <laughs> Indeed. Okay, any, any sighting of it now? Okay, no, okay. Sylvia, I wonder whether it's because Meta and Rick are pinned. Do you think that that might be the issue? I'm not I sure. I'm not hearing anymore, so. I'll, um, I'll take Meta off the pinning and then we'll see what. Are you seeing anything now? Only you, Rick. Only me. Okay, let me see if I can put up my, um, okay, I think I see what the problem is. I don't think I'm even there. So let me see if I can get into my uh, image here. Okay. Do you see me yet? See you, that's all I'm afraid. Oh, you do see me. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. great. That's promising. <laughs> okay, now let's see if we can see the image. Okay. Can you see the image? No. Nope. Okay. Because I reduced it in the corner. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what we have to do here. Okay, let's share screen. Okay, that's not working either. Okay. Okay. Rick, would you like, if I, since my screen share was working and we can, uh, so that we can uh, make sure there's uh, enough around to get to MacGyver, what I can do is just show the rest of my slides and say the Chinto and end, okay. and then that'll give you time to show the images afterwards, and then um, in our Q&A, we can discuss them. Does that seem more viable? That than... sounds good. I'm, okay, I'm game. Okay, let's do it. So I'm going to share screen again. I will, oh, uh, goodness, here we go. Doot, doot. And then you all can tell me uh, this time, since I'm no longer pinned, can you still see, can you see that? Yay. Yes. All right, all right. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead then and jump ahead. Um, the That question, who is the me in the audience, jumps back to the first image that's not in going there purposefully because it's not a satirical image. Many of you um, art historians and those um, African-Americanists um, in African-American studies in the audience you might recognize this Huey Lee Smith's Boy with Tire from 1952. Above it, the who and the me comes from the poet June Jordan. I'm gonna read the lines because the lines actually leap out. They punch out and they're punctured. The highlighted lines, I would argue, are terms and words that are coded that come, some from the title of your very book, Rick, but also from the questions and the tensions involved in Black visual satire that your book asks. See me, hear, fragile, leap, ing, and lead a black boy reckless to succeed, to wrap my pride around tomorrow and to go there without fearing. So one of the things that I hear and see in reading Rick's book is the recklessness a black visual satirist, the fearlessness of a Robert Colescott or a Kara Walker, and the shameless, as in that shameless, you know who and Archer Bob Motley's <laughs> love, my man's done leaving, painting that he closely reads, that are precisely what animates, right? The tensions in the reading of the book, of the reading of the images, right? This fear of loss. Who has what to lose? And I'd love to hear panelists talk about what's at stake in these images. Why do they produce so much angst, right? Even to the point of fighting. I mean, Rick, I think, uses the generous euphemism saying there's a little skirmish that takes place um, in front of the National Portrait Gallery for that image, which he'll show you all later, that is used as a book cover for uh, the title tit uh, for, for going there. But it's something to consider. Now, what's at stake, I would argue, if we go back to this image, right, Boy with Tire, 
to the next image here that is appendage to um, the kind of um, puncture words, the punctum, if you think about Bart's that I'm using, is this paper doll cut up from the Amos and Andy show um, that also, Rick, you talk about the show and talk about Colstock's parodic take on it um, in an image that he'll show you later. There we've got, if you look closely up at um, the figure, the paper figure out cutout's face, is that minstrel stain, to use your words, Rick, right? Those glaring red lips that are actually shown disproportionately, right? That cut out a figure and cut a figure, not in the tradition of distinction of like black portraiture and the way you beautifully illuminated in your other work, but in a way that is in time, in, in, in design, excuse me, to inculcate shame, right? So I have here the word loss, but you'll see also at the bottom of my slide, I have the word distributed by Pepsodent. So we could invert the question, which is a question I have for you and for the audience, Rick, is who gains? Who gains, like that's also the reverse of who lost, right? That, that kind of this image of um, the paper doll cut out, which is only one of many you can see over in the far left corner, excuse me, of my slide, there are several, right? There were several that Pepsi did, um, distributed and to what extent some of not the black visual satirists you look, you look at, but the menstrual actual images that they kind of use to circulate to sell products, right? Has so much to do with this issue of fetish and, and, and commoditization that animates the tension that you explore in the book. Even to, I pulled it out for us to look at because it brings to my next question in this slide to the, what uh, Richard Powell will show you when we look at the painting, Lord, my man's dog leaving, the lusty dog, right? There's a lusty dog that appears amongst hens and chickens and um, roosters and geese um, in uh, Archibald Maltley's painting that I would argue has a kind of um, foil in this minstrel cutout of this one of the paper doll uh, cutouts uh, that was included. I will note that this phrase, memorabilia and ephemera and advertisements, comes from the Smithsonian um, National Museum of African American History's cataloging, right? Um, this word ephemera, I, I pulled out and I put it beside the dog because it stays under that category. All the other images, including the other image of an alleged Amos figure um, that I uh, showed you, also have the category racist stereotypes that the Smithsonian uses. But for this dog, that category isn't used. But if, as you argue, Rick Powell, in your book, the context, right, it, and culture and the circulation value of these images, not just only the image itself, is critical to understanding its satirical import, then how, too, are we to take this dog, right? The other reason I highlighted ephemera in chapter three, The Minstrel Stain, it seems to me one of the incisive critiques of this book is that these images persist, the iconography persists in the kind of subconscious, the mental imagery and the oral subconscious of its audience. And so it's far from ephemera, which we think of as fleeting, right? Or lasting, it's actually long lasting. And so I will conclude now with my uh, Chinto. And the title of it, I'm impartial to paratext. And as Rick told you, he dedicates this book to none other than his mentor, and Rick has been a mentor to me, so I'm so grateful to kind of fall into that lineage, right? Um, his mentor, Gloria Wade Gells, you know, an illustrious uh, Black feminist scholar um, from Spelman. And um, the paratext says, it, said that Gloria Wade, Wade Gells taught Rick to read between the lines. So this is a chinto for you, Rick, and it's a sound poem, so you just hear it. Calling, calling, Gloria, Gloria, I think I got your number. Reading between the lines. More than a one liner up. Satire kill the serpent. Motley's major straight woman serpentine. Shimmering out, landishness, Rick's going there. Risk, graphic, pictures want you and you and you and you and you. New Yorker cover, identical, ironic, 
I imagine summon literacy in treat a reading. The church of visual satire. Too long, too much. Vices, follies, Lord. Satire is everywhere. The doors of the church are open, rooted, black, defiant, visual, necessary, satirist, going there. Thank you. Oh boy. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. My 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 immediate response, Meta, is are two polarities. One is trauma, and the other is I don't know the word, but it's the word of you know stealing yourself and preparing yourself for that trauma. And sometimes you prepare yourself for that trauma with. Uh, a stiff back and a laugh and 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 a head <laughs> and 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 those are the, those are the two polarities that I was feeling with the Huey Lee Smith, the Amos and Andy, and the dog. And if you remember that dog also pops up in Ali Harrington's mm -hmm. <laughs> painting um, that he did when he was a student at Yale mm -hmm. called Deep South. Mm -hmm. That everybody was reading as, oh, this poor man. Mm -hmm. And I know Ali was saying, look at that guy. <laughs> and the dog really tells you it's all buffoonery, mm -hmm. that it's all a big, you know, kind of joke. Mm -hmm. But you need that laugh. You need to be able to throw your back, your head back, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you, when you when you remember, you know, the pain, <laughs> when you remember the aspersions. When you, when you, when, when your inner body tells you, okay, I, I have, I, something happened that, 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 that's transformative for me. So how do I deal with it? How do I cope with it? And um, so wreck, fear, shame, loss. I mean, all of those words are, 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 are so much a part of what it means to be a person of African descent, you know, in the world. And, and yet, you know, the other part of that is, you know, that, that ability to kind of put steel in your back, to hold your head up high and to laugh. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why I just, I, I'm doing this, but um, I remember Maya Angelou um, when she had her show in the late sixties called Blues Black Blues, mm -hmm. talked about um, black women and, and the sounds that they would make when they would hear stuff. <laughs> and they weren't words. It was mm, or mm, <laughs> or mm. <laughs> and she went on through this whole list of, of onomatopoeia. <laughs> but that onomatopoeia was, was, was not just coping me mechanisms, it was poetry. It was, it was art. It was, it was, it was, it was something magical, you know. And, and, and so that's kind of part of what perhaps I was reaching for. And, you know, Lord, my man's me leaving is one of those paintings that, as I said, you know, I would show it and, and we would talk about it in the galleries and people would walk up to me and say, I can't handle it. <laughs> like those lips, that hair, stop, stop. And, and I tried to encourage the viewers to think about this as art. <laughs> and when you're in the world of art, anything can happen. And, and again, we have to thank um, of Brian Philip, uh, Philip Brian Harper for his incredible book, Abstract Expression, uh, or res what is it called? Abstract Aesthetics, mm -hmm. for reminding us that in the realm of art, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And with that anything is possible, you will be confronted and engaged with things that are that seem discombobulating, but again, you have to learn how to how to jump back and get back on your feet and to cope with it and to deal with it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. That's that's a, a lovely initial response and um, to uh, to Meta's um, Meta's response. And maybe we can go on now to Beverly. 
um, and then um, and and you can do an immediate response then, and then we'll just open it up to a more general conversation. So Beverly McIver is S. Espenshed, Professor of the Practice of Art in the Art, History and Visual Studies Department at Duke. She's an artist who's especially well known for her self-portraits. She's committed to producing arts that examines racial, gender, social and occupational identity. Her work has, of course, been studied by Rick um, on a number of occasions. Um, and is in numerous museum collections, including the North Carolina, Carolina Museum of Art, the Weatherspoon Art Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the NCCU Museum of Art, and the Nasher Museum. Thanks, Beverly. Thank you, Raji. I feel honored to be a part of this panel. And what Rick does with words, uh, my challenge, as a visual artist is to do with paint. Mm -hmm. So I wanna show you some images and I wanna talk about everything that we've been talking about in the context of the paintings that I've created. Rick, can you pull up your, uh, do you know how to pull up? Can you pull my okay, work? I'm up? gonna try. Okay. I'm gonna touch share screen. Okay. 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 Are you a host, co-host? Um, I don't know. But I see desktop. Okay, yeah. that's good. Okay. All panelists should be able to share. Fantastic. Are you seeing anything yet? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. I see the. So Are you, you seeing anything yet? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, I, I keep on asking the question. <laughs> well, so, so we've talked a little bit. Well, do we want to go to that one or do we, do we want to go there, Beverly? Uh, we want to go where you are right now. Okay. It's on the screen. Smiling white face. <laughs> so I thought it was really important to sort of give you a background uh, of where this white face, black face came from. Uh, when I was in, um, right after I graduated from NCCU, I decided that I wanted to be a clown, a professional clown. And in high school, I was, I was part of the clown club. Um, and before graduate school, can you show the next one? I decided to try out for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey's Circus um, as a clown. So two things that I didn't know. This is me. This is me with the blonde wig and my grandma's pajamas and my mother's church gloves. I mean, it was just like a, a coming together of a lot of different. <laughs> parts of my life and my, uh, my family to get me looking like this. Uh, you see that I'm third in line uh, with the white shirt. I'm the only black person standing there waiting to do my spiel before this stupid clown. What I didn't realize about Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bay Circus is that at the time that I was applying, there were no black people part of the circus and there were no women that were part of it, right? The women that were part of the circus were actually men dressed as women. Wow. Right? So, okay, so bad idea, right? I was the average age of a clown when people joined the circus, was, which was 27. That was the only thing I had going for me. Next slide. So this, uh, before, you know, it started white face. And then this is one of the first paintings, which is entitled, How You Like Me Now. Uh, that I made after seeing a Duke performance about that I could be a black clown. It was that literal, these, I saw these white people dressed in blackface on a stage at the American Dance Festival. And I was like, oh my God, I can liberate myself from being white and become black, which I was really proud of. I was like, yes, uh, because I wanted to talk about my black experiences next. With that in mind, my mother uh, spent her entire life being a, um, a domestic worker, raising white children um, and taking care of white families. This particular painting was uh, mimicked after my mother's occupation. It is entitled, Mammy, How I Love You, right? 
So I dressed up in blackface and sat myself up with some white dolls and began to do things that I had seen my mother do for the white children that she cared for. Next. So from there, right, I had these stereotypes in my head about, okay, I'm black, I can do some things that are definitely attached to stereotypes of black people. So the first thing that came to my mind is eating watermelon, right? I have that piece that uh, Rick, part of Rick's book called Silence, uh, Silence, where I actually, at the time, the reason that I'm looking down and I have that watermelon in my hand is because it was so sweet and juicy. I dropped a seed and I was looking down to watch the seed hit the floor, right? In that silence. Um, but I took it a little bit further because I was living out in Arizona and I was like, oh, ain't no black people out here. I want a man. Where am I going to get a man from, a black man from? He ain't out here, right? So I thought about the idea of loving in black and white, loving someone and other, someone that was different from me, right? And I had this friend of mine pose with me, David is his name. And the first thing that I thought that we would do together as sort of a liberating act was to eat watermelon together, right? And so then this creature, I was like, okay, you know, we're in this, how does this feel? Is he cute? I can't tell because I've been so programmed to, you know, see blackness, black men as beautiful. I'm like, mm, is he really cute? Okay, these are all learned behaviors, by the way, people. Okay, so next slide. So I create this entire bit series of work where I am engaged with uh, David, uh, who feels very, very comfortable and entitled with his white male body. I mean, he was beautiful, no doubt about it. He was completely naked in most of the pictures. And he was like, do you want to get naked? I was like, no, oh my God but they address the idea of loving someone that's different from you in the context of being in Arizona where there was no other options really. And it addresses the idea of this white man who I think was completely fascinated by my dress and blackface and this odyssey of me like just being whatever he perceived me to be. Um, and so we made these paintings, these images. I had a friend photograph us making these images and Loving in Black and White was born. The problem with going there <laughs> as a visual artist is that no one wants to show this work. I have not, want, I've only seen, I made this work, oh, I guess it's been 15, 18 years ago. And it was shown one place in Chandler, Arizona, which they immediately shut down because somebody was complaining about the intimacy of these images. So, but the full body of work, Loving in Black and White has never been seen because nobody really wants to go there. Do I have another slide or is that it? Ah, so this uh, dance with me, me dancing with David, um, in my black face with my mother's church gloves, you know, looking up to him, having the sun hit my face, feeling incredibly beautiful, uh, and in some ways feeling validated because this white male was, you know, who I learned growing up were, you know, were heroes, right? With Barnaby Jones and Mannix and Cannon and all these shows that I watched as a youngster where white males were in power, they would come in and save the woman and kill the bad people. Uh, so I grew up thinking that white was right and that white males to have the attention of a white male uh, validated me as being beautiful, um, desirable and those sorts of things. Okay, I think that's it, right? Well, I just got to say something. <laughs> and what I have to say is 
<laughs> well, there are a couple of things. What I find so <laughs> fascinating about this series, Beverly, is, is the mask. <laughs> because, <laughs> because as you were describing the work, I was saying to myself, well, Beverly, you are African-American. <laughs> But as you know, and I know, and I think as our panel knows, that's beside the point. Because there is this mask, right. there is this layer, there is this veil that in these works, you, 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 you add to the mix. And in adding that veil and that mask to the mix, that's really what, that's kind of the punctum to kind of go back to, to that Bart idea. These, this, this paint that's on your, on your surface that, 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 that's, like, that's loaded with history. It's a history that goes way past Barnum and Bailey. And it, and it goes to, as you said, minstrelsy, but it also goes to, as I talk about in the book, Commedia dell'arte, this, this old world tradition where paint on the face is not an illusion as much as it is um, a ritual, you know, right. it, it, is, it, 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 it creates a, 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 an image and it creates a persona that, that, that the audience, you know, gets to, to engage with, gets to critique, um, sometimes laughs at, um, sometimes is revulsed by. And, and on one hand, it's not surprising that this series has only been shown once. <laughs> because one understands the challenges that, that, that we, and I'm putting myself in here, that we face with, with getting into that inner, inner kind of um, issue of self and desire and beauty and, 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 and then the history that race attaches to that. Right. Um, I'm just gonna say another quick thing. And I think the other reason why I love this series so much and the reason why it's really appropriate for this book is as I argue in the Robert Colescott chapter, there is power in, um, in an artist, in a spokesperson to impose a kind of a, to use their, themselves as a kind of a foil. Um, it's disarming. And this goes back to Don Quixote and Cervantes, you know, this idea of, 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 the, of this traveler who, who sees stuff and it's crazy and they incorporate themselves into the narrative. This is what Colescott does and this is what you do. And this is why this work is so important because it is so brave and it is so, so honest and it is so beautiful too. I mean, you paint these pictures with such lush strength and 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 savoir faire that 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 they operate on multiple levels so i mean i could just go off on it for a while but but i see um, my interlocutors <laughs> nodding and doing things so i want to open this up to to Huey and 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 to Meta if they have some thoughts as well since we have the artists here which is always um, important rick if you can stop sharing we'll have your uh, face is bigger. Okay. Thanks, thank, thanks everyone. Um, so um, Meta and Huey, you've been invited to, to um, by Rick to, to, to comment specifically on what, what's just been discussed. If you would like to take that up, um, please do. And then I think I'm, go I'm just going to remind our audience that you can Pose questions in the Q and A, um, and um, and I think that we also have a lot of questions here already um, that we can that we can then return to. So, um, Meta and Huey, if you would like to respond um, to uh, to Rick's invitation, please do go ahead. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I um, mean, part of the generativeness um, of what you shared in conversation with Rick of these specific paintings, right? And this is the thing that I'm, I, I love how Rick talked about the brush show. What's difficult, and this is one of the questions, 
when we see it in these, you know, Rick mentioned earlier technology in the mediated forms, right? Where um, we, it's harder for us to get to the love poured into every layer of paint, right? So that we get the texture of the multiple veils, right? That also enable the viewer to recognize the space, both intimacy on the one hand that you spoke to, but also the gap that exists between the artwork as its own work of art, right? Mm -hmm. And the artist that is, has a relation to that work, right? But it also is at a, as a, at a remove. And I think that, that, that Blackface in the Clown does that so beautifully. Um, the issue that you brought up that I don't think any of us yet explored is the issue of exhibition. And Rick, you bring this up in the book, right? And that I would really, I'm really so grateful for you to, for bringing that up, that there have been re the resistance to kind of exhibiting this work, not by you, right? But by galleries or museums or curators. And what does that mean? And what does that do to our ability to appreciate the very lineages that Rick Powell's book um, explores? Uh, there, that, that to me is worthy of discussion because I think about, and I'd love to ask you if, for example, your doll series, when I was doing the cutout for my slide, I was like, oh, I really would love to hear what Beverly um, has to say about kind of what is the relationship to dolls? What is it about dolls in the kind of artistic imaginary that occupies certain spaces that other figures um, uh, don't seem to? Um, or your daddy series, right? It may, that people may respond to. So I'm gonna turn it over to Huey, but those are my first thoughts. Huey? I would just love to hear Beverly respond to those fantastic questions that you just posed. Those are good questions. <laughs> well, I'll respond. Uh, I think the, uh, it's, it's ironic that, you know, the first thing that I chose before painting was to be a clown, that I love dressing up, that masking myself mm -hmm. was something that was incredibly liberating, that I could be myself without judgment. And I could be accepted in a way that I felt like I couldn't, you know, without the mask. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, about the dolls is that when I was growing up in the 70s, there were, I didn't have any black dolls. Just, I had, you see that white doll that I, Mammy with her, uh, Molly with her favorite Mammy. That was the kind, those were the kind of dolls I had. They were all white. And then, maybe less than five years ago, a friend of mine found Gracie, this little black doll, uh, which I've painted numerous times uh, on an auction and, and gave it to me. And I was, I mean, I felt like she had given me, you know, my alter ego or my inner child in that little doll, Gracie, uh, whom I immediately began to paint. So that doll or caring for or loving um, or being that little voice inside, the little Beverly that I have to protect, um, that does feel a little inadequate about things, life, everything, um, is significant and very, very important to my painting process. The reason that I've decided to make these paintings as luscious and as beautiful and tactile as I possibly can is that I want the viewer, everybody looks at the work and they can go only one layer or two layers and then that's it. They're not interested in going there, right? They're not interested. They cannot go there, in fact. So, but they can look at it and perceive it as, oh, look at this well-painted, beautiful, luscious, icing on a cake, you know, application of paint, uh, oh, the image, but never really go there. So it's really sort of an, a, a thing about, you know, increasing my audience, if you will, uh, by letting people who want to just see the surface, love it as a painting, period, 
And then those who really want to go there and go deep uh, to read what these characters are perhaps engaging in or doing or meaning the mass, et cetera. And Beverly, I just want to throw out really quickly, the power of these works is that they are not superficial. The power of these works is that they are complex, not yes. just complex narratively, but complex as they are created, as they are structured. And that's one of the points I try to make about the difference between mm -hmm. stereotype and satire. Yes. Because stereotype is one dimensional. Stereotype yes. is stupid. It, it does, all it does is it focuses on something really, really blunt and simplistic, and then that's it, you know. But satire requires work. <laughs> satire okay. is layered. Yeah. Satire is art to the highest level where, where you say something, but you say it in a way, you present it in a way, you perform it in such a way that that, that really shows artistry and shows the underlying possibilities of what it is that you've created. And, and, and that's the heart, go ahead. Like yeah. you too. It's layered and tactile as Beverly said, and subtle, right? So it's both yeah. and, which we get from your work. It's Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's so wonderful, Beverly, to hear you talk about the kind of, because I just didn't realize how many sort of processes of mediation were involved in making that work. And that in fact is allows, what that allows that layering to happen, right? Where there's right. a particular performance of a uh, relation that's posed for a photograph that's produced that then becomes the basis for a painting, right? So there's all these kinds of levels of remove and each point becomes um, an ability to kind of inflect the ones that come before and after. So it does have that kind of richness so that it's almost giving us a model of a certain kind of satirical process of making or a, a process of making that like in its construction makes room for the satirical in these ways that, as Rick said, the sort of one dimensional stereotypical evacuates. And Huey, isn't it amazing that when we get to the 1960s, we have a whole set of artists who are exploring these veils. I'm yeah. talking about Baraka's plays. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Ed Bullen's productions. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Larry Rivers, um, Olympia. I like Olympia and Blackface. I'm yeah. talking about Melvin Van Peebles, Watermelon Man. I mean, it's amazing when you go into history, you begin to realize that, that, that Beverly's brilliance does have a, it has a lineage, you know? Yeah. And, and people are playing with these layers um, in time. And no. the other thing you do too is from the 60s to the 90s, right? Like that that lineage doesn't go from the 60s to just 2020, right? We don't get this kind of big leap. Um, and if you look at the period of the 90s and the work, like the when you um, move to Michael Ray Charles's work in the 90s and then kind of look at close reading and going there to Bamboozled. But Huey, you look like you were about to say something. Yeah, no, I mean, I think because, you know, in the minstrel stain chapter, what Rick has so beautifully done for us and identified is this kind of, not only kind of consistent engagement, but pointed to and given us criteria for understanding a whole range of related sort of cultural production, right? So he gives us the example of thinking about, say, Cindy Sherman and her bus riders. We also think about Eleanor Anton or her performative work. In the conversation now, I'm thinking about, um, Fassbinder's film Whitey, right, from 1971. I don't know if y'all have seen it, but it's insane um, mm -hmm. because it's all about masking and certain kinds of blackface, right? And it tells the character of, the, this tells the story of this um, oppressed, enslaved man played by Gunter Kaufman and his mother, who is a German woman in total blackface, like super cool blackface and a frizzy wig, but all the other kind of white characters who are the masters aside from uh, Gunter Kaufman's love interest have this kind of thick white paste makeup applied to them that is almost green. I mean, it's almost green or kind of blue, right? So it just allows us to really rethink all these kinds of cultural cues and moves that artists across the cultural spectrum, both nationally and internationally are making and gives us a framework to think about, is this something that is working sort of stereotypically or is that they're that kind of layering that kind of dynamic that Rick has beautifully unfolded for us that we can see in its visual operations that might open onto other kinds of possibilities within that cultural milieu. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a great question, Huey, especially because genre, right? The thing that's interesting to me is about the move, right? Uh, Beverly, with your work, you know, there's, we talked about paint, right? Um, Huey's response in part to your question, Rick, um, particularly generating from the 60s and then to the 70s, right? To Whitey, we really are looking at film, at music videos, because you start with this really great reading. And I thought of when you asked me to pick uh, a few images and share with you, Rick, um, which ones I wanted you to show. Originally, I thought, man, maybe the still from This Is America. And I was like, no, no, no. The thing is, at 740 million views, everybody's seen that. That's not the one that the audience needs to see to recognize, right? But you start with This Is America. And I, I think what's interesting is it's not just Danny Glover, excuse me, Donald Glover, right? And Hiro Mirai, the filmmakers, This Is America. And I think it's so useful because it does the kind of work satirically, both sonically, right? You know, I talked about the hearing mm -hmm. and, and sound as well as visually, as well as in terms of body and embodied movement and mm -hmm. masking the Beverly you gesture toward um, that gets to these issues of, a question I do have for you, Rick, is to what extent does it matter if the image is moving or if it's still? If the image is in color or if it's in black and white? If it's in Kosat's graphite, I'm thinking of MLK and the Heavenly Oak Host, it's like black and white where you had that um, dimension with the white supremacist God, this pictured and then the minstrel devil and, and MLK smack down there in the middle being told, go to you know where, um, like go there, right? So, I mean, to what extent does genre how does genre, and I think your book really does kind of get at this, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that, even in terms of your selection and the ordering of the chapters and the, the argumentative kind of tour de force of where you move in the book. Beta, it goes back to your original question, um, who? <laughs> and, and, and I would just add to that, and I talk about this in that first chapter, we need to know who, who the satirist is. Mm -hmm. uh, we really, really need to know who the satirist is. So in the case of Donald Glover's This is America, there's no question, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of, of uh, um, some of the other examples, we, Beverly's, in the case of Beverly's example, you mm -hmm. know, we know that Beverly is, is the painter and we know Beverly is the subject mm -hmm. and that helps, it helps. There's still some challenges there, but it helps. Mm -hmm. But in the case of so much visual art where we are separate from the, 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 the creator, where we aren't really clear about what, what hand was the hand that molded and made this work. And I, I'm speaking from personal experience, because remember, I, I commissioned David Hammond to do How You Like Me Now in 1989, and he was in Rome when we installed it. And I didn't even, I didn't even think mm. that, that, that that would be an issue, mm. because I knew um, this Black artist did it, but the public, did not know a black artist did it. So, mm -hmm. so, so when you talk about performance, I would say that part of performance is the fact that there is a body that is that is commanding, um, um, has an authority around what's being presented. Of course, you have something like in the case of of uh, Putney Swope, which I bring up, which is an interesting example because Putney Swope is a white director. Putney Swope. Is, is actually a white voice on top of a black actor. But, but the narrative is a narrative that, um, as I describe in the book, it, it is embraced by black people because it is a critique of um, capitalism. It is a critique of Madison Avenue. It is you know, a kind of a radical late 60s you know, kind of statement. But, but, but I think you nailed it, Maida. We do need to know who is the satirist. Um, that's really, really important because that's part of the key, I think, to understanding. It's not the entire answer, but mm -hmm. it really helps to know what, what, what are the possible experiences that lie behind um, this person who created this work. Mm -hmm. If I could come in there um, for a moment, because I think that this also brings up um, uh, a question, brings back us back to the question that Huey asked. Um, early on around um, what what the black is in black visual satire I mean I think it I think I think it brings brings that question up to the fore um, because um, I, I 
the way the way that he posed this was that um uh um that that you're you're in a sense situating a story about african american satire in relation to western art right um i think and huey you'll correct me no doubt if um if i if if i get if i misrepresent you here but as i understood it um to some extent what he's asking asking you there is where blackness is already in this history of western art um certainly in um in in uh in the 18th century um it's very much there right um uh, a blackness is very much there of if with a certain kind of understanding of blackness that is um but also i think that in um in the work, sometimes it seems as if um, blackness is a, um, an affective mode, right? Um, you talk about racial self-hatred. Sometimes it's descriptive. You talk about African-American um, popular culture. Um, sometimes it's material. Um, you talk about um, the, an African-American underclass. Um, and so, um, and so, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more um, about this question of what it is we understand as as the black in um, in black satire here. Um, just just taking up just taking up that very important question that Huey asked early on. Well, uh, thank you, Ranji. Um, I try to address that in chapter one, and I yeah. do it in perhaps two. Um, uh, fundamental away, uh, which I'll do again. <laughs> and, and, and the first criteria that I give is um, it's, it's the satirist. And we just talked about that, 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 that it's really important to know, you know, who is this voice and, and to make assumptions around who that voice is based on certain kinds of experiences and histories and, uh, and realities that, that peoples of African descent you know, face and experience in, um, in, the, in the world. The second category, and this kind of goes, Ranji, to what you were talking about when uh, you were giving that litany of, of kind of contexts, is that there are contexts that are very specific to the Black experience, and, but, 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 but they are not monolithic. They're quite, they're quite diverse. As we've seen already with Beverly, we have um, one of those narratives being, you know, a sense of self, a sense of, of, of self-worth. Um, we also have, you know, um, love and, and, and the conundrums of love um, that Black people experience uh, uh, as, as, as a possible topic. As I mentioned in, in the book, racism is, 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 is a topic that, 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 that is a kind of a marker, is a kind of a sign that, that kind of brings us into um, the fold for something that might be Black and, and, and satirical. I'm thinking of some of the examples that, 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 that I show um, from both Colescott's work and also Ollie Harrington's works. You know, the worlds are very different. Um, Colescott based in the Bay Area and then um, Arizona, uh, Ollie Harrington uh, first in Harlem, uh, then in Berlin. Um, but, but they share, you know, the understanding and the sense that, that, that the black experience is an absurd experience. <laughs> that, that the world that we walk through is a world that says one thing and gives you something else. Mm -hmm. um, the world that we walk through says that we live in a democracy, but it is anything but a democracy. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so that context is really, really important. And the third part brings me back also to, um, to Maida's um, um, final um, um, in that group, target who is me and audience. Mm -hmm. because, because I would argue that, that, that ultimately um, a Black audience um, will help us to contextualize and make sense of what it is that we're looking at. The challenge though, and I talk about this uh, in, in the book, is that by the time we get to the end of the 20th century, by the time Richard Pryor has entered our world, we now realize that our stories, the things that we let, used to laugh at in those Ch Chitlin Circuit productions and those little black clubs and in black colleges has now been made available to the world is now something that everybody can weigh in on, something that everybody can kind of critique. And, and, and the question is, are they equipped to understand the nuances and the particularities 
of, of what it is that 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 um, not just a Richard Pryor, but a Beverly McKeever or a Carol Walker or or a Robert Colescott is is laying on us. So 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 I would say that that it's, it's as simple as that. Um, um, with more nuance, of course, the the satirist is black or or at least is positioned as such. The the, the subject matter is black in all of its complexity and complications and histories and, and experiences and, and an audience, you know, um, you know, in other words, an audience kind of brings, you know, kind of meaning and worth and value and understanding to that. That kind of goes back to my original comments to Huey about being that little innocent kid um, listening to all this wild talk and people moving and acting different ways. <laughs> and I wasn't ready to be a part of the audience then. You know, sometimes it takes a little more time to say, okay, I now get it. So maybe if I could follow up on that, Rick, which is you know, really rich and helpful. And thank you, Ranja, for pushing the conversation in this um, productive direction. Is, um, I suppose, are we talking about, I mean, it's interesting, are we talking about Black as a sort of structural position um, in relationship to culture, right? And then we can think about how how much more expansive Black is, say, in a British context than it might be in an American context? Or for you, does it specifically have to relate to a particular history or experience of transatlantic slavery within the sort of context of the larger diaspora, right? Well, it's part of the problem of Black. And you're, you're, you're talking to someone who um, named his survey book, Black Art, A Cultural History. And I named it that precisely because of both the conundrum of Black and the irony of the conundrum of Black, it being a term that in its strangest one-dimensional, one-syllabic way encompasses um, Brixton, encompasses Johannesburg, encompasses Greensboro, North Carolina, where Beverly's from, or Washington, D.C., where Maida's from. Um, in other words, it, it is on one hand um, a... a, a, a a potentially essentialist kind of a crucible. And at the same time, if you, if you are attuned, you can read through that black prism and you can see all sorts of nuances and elements and qualities and aspects of it. But fundamentally, I would go back to Stuart Hall since you brought him up and go back to his essay, What's Black in Black Popular Culture? And he ultimately says in one of those, like I think one, two, three, four, five, sixes, is that we're talking about experience and we're talking about history. We're mm -hmm. talking about people's lived experiences, people's lived realities, the things that they go through, and the realization that, that, that what I experience in terms of racism might be different than what somebody experiences in, uh, in France, but, but, but we have a few things in common that, that might connect and bring these things together. And, and, and again, that may not be a satisfactory answer because blackness is so complex and it is so diverse. Um, but, but, but it seems to work when we begin to, to try to map out and, and try to find the usefulness and the utility of something that on one hand is so monosyllabic and at the same time gets kind of used and pointed out and, and identified, you know, not just with us, but over millennia. Yeah. And I Oh, go ahead, Maida. Oh, I was going to say, since you talked about the monosyllabic, and since we're on this kind of monoplanar <laughs> nature of Zoom, I wanted to hold up my physical copy, not the virtual copy of going there. And I wanted the audience, you know, not look at all my tabs, but how <laughs> thick it is how beautiful it is, what it means to hold the weight of it. It has Beverly's, um, one of Beverly's paintings on the back. And I wanted to talk about the opposite of the black, which is not an opposite, which is a slant, right? That you are working on and that you worked on when you commissioned this work um, by David Hammond. And that's, if it's true, Rick, that the black, right? Even though, you know, as opposed to in response to Huey's question about the African um, and the African diaspora, is multivalent, multi layered, multi textured. And if we think about uh, Carrie James Marshall showing up his, his palette, a decolonized palette of various black pigmented paints that he's using, right, in that, um, in the recent documentary that you were in, and Black Art in the Absence of Light, is that 
is there, is that also, how does that work, right? Once we move out of the realm of the black to the realm of the red, the white, the blue, and the blonde or the yellow or the straw or the pale. I'm not sure how, what we'll decide to, to kind of, to, to call this, but what do these colors do, right? Um, in um, uh, the history of African-American lineage of art um, that make this book and the work that it's trying to do in relationship to textured and textural blackness. Well, <laughs> what um, they offer as us? Rick, before, before you respond, can I just come in here a moment? Because we also have um, you know, a question from, from our audience that, that might also be interestingly brought in here. Um, uh, you know, there are various uh, notes of congratulations um, in the Q&A um, already, but Michelle Longino asks, um, asks a question, to what extent is black satire necessarily oppositional satire and dependent? Can there be black satire without white presence? And you know, if if I could just sort of maybe maybe ask this again through some of the other conversations that we've already um, been having, I think that this once again sort of goes to the question of um, of how we understand um, uh, that 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 idea of Western art, if you like, um, that may or may not stand in in independence from black visual satire. Well, first of all, um, um, I want to I want to address the cover, but I want to immediately jump to Professor Longino's comment. Um, satire is fundamentally critique, so I'm taking the adjective off of it. <laughs> um, satire is a vehicle for someone to point out um, misgivings, um, uh, social. Um, Malapropisms. In other words, it, it's 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 a vehicle for um, signifying and and responding to um, something that is that is perceived of as, as as problematic within the social cultural context. So one can't one can't be a satirist without that. I think that social um, um, critical um, kind of position. And and in the case of peoples of of, of African descent. Um, we, we, we operate and we live in a world, and I'm thinking about Ali Harrington, for example, his cartoons um, on Harlem, um, they, they, they do two things. On one hand, they, they, they do point out, you know, the absurdity of, of, of racism uh, in the world. But the other thing that they do is that they, they look inward and they really kind of critique the shortcomings and the pitfalls of, 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 of the interior world of, 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 of Harlemites and what have you. I'm thinking about that, uh, that image um, that he did in the early 1940s called um, Bomb Shelter that showed the guy with the zoot suit and the big shoulders and the hat that, that was so big and wide that little kids could stand underneath it. So, so, so Michelle's question is interesting, but I think it ultimately does sit on the idea of Critique and um, and 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 I just have to say that 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 um, one doesn't have to go far in this world that we live in and to be a person of African descent without being stung, without being touched by um, the the kind of claw, if you will, of of, of racism. So it's not going to be surprising that a good part of this satire is connected to um, um, racism and a critique of racism. But I want to quickly respond to Maida and say that. Um, as you know, Maida and, and, and Huey and Ranji, we don't get to choose the covers of our books. Um, our publishers say that this is the image that's going to sell the book. And in the case of, of this one, um, Yale said, we've got to put How You Like Me Now on the cover of this book. And it's a fascinating work. Um, one of the things that makes it most fascinating for me is that after it got knocked down, uh, in that brouhaha on the streets of Washington, D.C., and we drug it back to the Washington Project for the Arts. I was getting these calls from people saying, well, how do you like your, your white Jesse Jackson now? Ha, 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 ha. And then I got that one call from this guy who said, you know, I like that piece. And I like it because I'm an albino. And nobody looks at me mm. and loves me and understands that I'm Black. 
that mm. I'm black just like anybody except my skin is white, I got blue eyes and I got blonde hair. And when I heard that, I said, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I said, you know, David is more brilliant than I thought he was. I know he was critiquing and using cool modi mm -hmm. as a kind of a counterpoint, mm -hmm. but, but perhaps maybe what he was also saying is that blackness, that, that you can have a book called Black Visual Satire and have a blonde, blue-eyed, white person on the cover, and it can still tell that message, that, that we are in some ways black, and we're going back to your question, Ranji uh, and, and Huey, <laughs> black is this word, and it is both experiential and it is something that, that we can see, but it is also conceptual. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and, it is, uh, and it is a kind of a delightful kind of uh, conundrum or alchemy that, 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 that has operated, um, um, one could argue since the transatlantic slave trade, when they stopped naming Yoruba people Yoruba and Congo people Congo and phone people phone and called them noir or mm -hmm. negro. Um, and, and or or black. Yeah, and I, that's so that's so rich, um, Rick. Thank you. And I, I mean, I think to to follow on that and maybe to speak um, further to sort of Ranji's question. I mean, I think what you sort of really, really you know chart is the ways in which there is this um, long, deep tradition of signification and reading within black cultures that has a sort of visual manifestation once artists have access to it and are able to move it into that domain and conversation. But I think we could also sort of think dialectically, right? In which blackness has sort of been mobilized satirically to critique some of the foundations or tendencies of Western art, right? So I think about, you know, Alphonse Allais' 1898 cartoon, Negroes fighting in a cave at night, right? And it's just a black square. <laughs> it's just reproduced as a black square because he's trying to critique the kind of move towards the non-objective that he's seeing that anything could sort of be the subject matter. And of course, as we know now, that joke is something that Kazimir Malevich takes up, right? And that that is in fact what exists underneath his black square of 1915. So I think there's a way in which if we sort of think about this sort of dialectically, we can understand not only the important ways in which black artists are sort of mobilizing visual satire, but the ways in which they're having to respond to previous artistic mobilizations of black folks in, in stereotypical ways to critique and expand Western art for the ends of those artists. And your example, Huey, thank you so much, brings me back to um, Meta and conversations that we have all the time about image versus text or image and text. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that one is one, one, one assumes that one is just kind of operating purely in this realm of sight. Yeah. And one has to remind themselves um, that, that you have to use words to describe what it is that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. and, and once you begin to use words, you begin to look at the titles and the captions. And, and, and there's this need for us as, as, as human beings, um, as, as, as seers, um, also to be readers. And, and, uh, and, and satire is, in, is definitely imbricated in this kind of thorny relationship between the spoken and the oral and, 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 and the visual. Um, yeah. And therein lies the double challenge because it's hard enough to, 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 to read something and to make sense of it, but to see it and to tie that into what one reads um, is, is even more complicated. Yes, yes. And I think that, that beautifully sort of speaks to the way in which um, the kind of work of Black study as you so beautifully show us here demands this kind of attention to a range of cultural forms, a range of places and sites that we might no normally consider for art historical narration, uh, an attention to the verbal and the nonverbal in a way that suggests um, how we can begin to understand the field through which a common sense uh, is produced uh, or a kind of under common sense is produced that enables uh, black satire to you know, emerge and articulate itself. And this is why Beverly's point about exhibition matters. Mm. Because if Huey, and you're spot on, right? If mm -hmm. these are the lineage, right? Is in conversation, right? With earlier lineages, one 
aside from the space of artistic collective or coterie in which we know even we go back to spiral even an artistic coterie such as spiral can be exclusionary right and we've got emma amos but we don't get faith ringle right and so mm -hmm. that means if we don't have an exhibition right then we have further delim delimited the possibility around the expansiveness of this lineage because it is that exposure not just of audience spectators but of artists to other artworks um, by other artists that help further kind of enrich that lineage, right? Um, so you can't rip off of something that you haven't yet received a rip off of, right? Uh, to put it more vernacularly, right? Um, and so I, I, I'll, I'll pause there, but I just thought that was such a, a great point. Um, and thank you so much, Ranji, for getting us on this path, right? You know, Rick in his book uses that phrase that uh, going there references a figural pathway, right? And those are not my words, they're yours, yours, Rick. And I, I really do think that idea of journey, right, um, is a collaborative one. And so I'm, I'm so thankful to you, Ranji, for uh, directing us because there, 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 there needs to be sometimes um, a tour guide. And I, and I don't just mean like thinking in terms of like intellectually or visually or culturally or rhetorically or conversationally, I also think because Rick, you use that term trauma, right? Um, that sometimes I think the wounds that people sometimes bring to the work mm. includes their ability to go on the journey and mm. then they blame the work um, for mm. work that actually takes place before they come to the work. Yeah. And for me, sometimes some of these works have such healing um, potential in them. And I don't want to become overly sentimental and say healing properties. I said potential for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Not, you know, the potential for healing in them comes in that dialogic interaction, right? In that dialectical. It's not a one-sided at all. It's not just product or just commodity. And so thank you. Um, thank you again. And when you said that, Maida, I thought about Beverly's description of silence. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at that black watermelon seed yes. dropped to the floor. I mean, talk about poetry and mm -hmm. and poignancy, and 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 it's dropping from this 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 icon of ridicule and put down and and also love because of the sweetness. Of, so mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a painting that's just loaded with mm -hmm. with stuff, <laughs> and it's called silence. <laughs> Thank, thank, thanks so much. You know, we are, um, we are over time, but, um, but maybe, maybe just, just, um, just to ask one more thing and just to also note that Elizabeth Brown would very much like to see an exhibition of Beverly's work um, on, on Duke's campus. Um, Pedro Lash um, sends great, great congratulations. Um, John Bowles, um, thanks, thanks everyone very much. You know, just just a question that I might just sort of th throw out there. Um, I'm I'm interested in this uh, in in this question actually that Meta just just um, just cited the figural pathway and the relation of the figural to satire um, and the question of abstraction. Um, you talk a little bit about it towards the end of the book, um, Rick, um, uh, that abstraction, in a sense, wasn't a discursive mode, you say on 199, wasn't a discursive mode that supported narrative strains in art. And I'm, I'm interested if you might just sort of say a little bit about um, abstraction, um, the figural, and and the narrative strain that maybe underpins satire? Mm -hmm. Great question, Ranji. And um, it's a complicated one. And um, um, all of my interlocutors understand where, where, where I'm coming from on this one, because we all know that, <laughs> that all art ultimately is, is an abstraction. All art you know, uses this, this, this canvas, this paint, this 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 wood, this this concrete, and it and it makes something, and it and it and it seems to reference 
bodies. It seems to reference reality or, or the natural world. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it's constructed. It's really kind of manufactured in it and it kind of pulls these, 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 these elements, these materials together to make something. And, and as I say at the very beginning of the book, the thing that, that people don't quite get with Lord My Man's Leaving is that it's an abstraction. It, it, it is, we are referencing figures. We are referencing this kind of landscape. We have that lusty dog, those three, I love the chickens. There's a white chicken, there's a red chicken, there's a black chicken, and they're all kind of like almost doing the Supremes <laughs> together. But, but my point being is that Motley is creating something that, 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 that is nodding to the social and, and, and a narrative story. But, 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 but one should not lose sight of the purple sky or rather the tangerine sky and, and the purple um, buildings and the, and the yellow and all these kind of, it, it, is, an, it, is, it is a black imaginary. That, that he has concocted. And we can take that all the way to Cole Scott and, 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 to, and to some of the other artists, or Carol Walker's perhaps the best example of that, um, an artist who is, is, is lamp blasted for um, her work. And as, and as Philip Bryan Harper reminds us, people lose sight of the fact that, that, that these, are, these are delightful constructions um, made out of paper, um, pasted on walls, that, that, that reference and allude to narrative that, 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 that seem to suggest um, a, a, a world that, that we might vaguely be familiar with through antebellum literature or through, or through contemporary life and, and trauma. But, 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 but they are first and foremost, you know, kind of abstractions. And, and, and so when I make that statement at the end about the tension between you know, um, something that is that 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 has no references at all to the real world. Please don't take that as me saying that these other works that have references to the real world kind of solve everything for us, because those works too are are kind of um, in their own way, um, you know, kind of constructions that that, that through the mode of painting um, or or even photography, or in the case of I love the work by Joyce Scott. Um, um, man eating watermelon, beads. <laughs> that, 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 that we have this work that, that, uh, that, 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 that nods and acknowledges um, histories and, and real bodies and real lives, but does it through these um, very, very complicated artistic uh, processes. So maybe to follow up on that, Rick, I mean, I'm sort of thinking now with something like Frank Bowling's Who's Afraid of Barney Newman, would that be a moment of black visual satire? Um, say more about that. Well, so for those who don't know, so it's this beautiful painting that in, I think, what, 1971, maybe, um, in which he's looking at Barnett Newman's abstract canvases with these kind of famous zips that go up above, go through them. And his painting is red. Um, it's the colors of, you know, African nationalism, red, uh, yellow, and um, green. Um, and there's a kind of, uh, shadow of the America con American continents that sort of emerges from behind it, right? To sort of suggest that, um, you know, Newman's work that seems to be completely abstract and without any content actually does have a certain kind of content and that one can address it or push directly on it, right? Um, by sort of filling it up or populating it with a certain kind of ghosted imagery, even while maintaining the same kind of formal logic of the stripes. See, for me, the title works and that helps with that, you know? Yeah. Um, when, I, when I engage with, with Frank Bowling, um, I, I tend to kind of, um, how would I put it? Um, I let him wash over me. <laughs> and, and, and he is a great master of, of the wash, of, of, of these stains that literally kind of soak and kind of uh, emanate through the painting. And then he just adds that little bit of, of silhouette, those, those, those maps of, of, of countries that, that aren't quite maps, but, but, yeah. but, 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 if, but if, you, if you were a good geography student, You'll say, okay, that's South America, <laughs> or or that's the U.S., um, or, or 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 I think I'm looking at the Atlantic Ocean here. So 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 you know, Frank Bowling is 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 a is a fascinating figure of for 
as you as you've suggested, this this ability to signify, you know, mm -hmm. on our art history, and at the same time, kind of assert himself. Um, as as you know, in the book, I use those multiple examples of of de Kooning, and then you have. Uh, um, a Robert Colescott, and then there are other people who are signifying on the women images. So, so there's a lot of that going on in the art world of, of kind of signifying and looking back at what somebody else has done. Um, and of course, with Colescott, though, there's no question that we have this Black imprimatur um, that's, that's kind of layered on top of that with that head of, of Aunt Jemima, who he calls the kind of ur mother of, 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 of the world. Hmm. We talked about the kind of signifying around <coughs> race. Um, but, uh, but to return again to Beverly's to use of the term intimacy, it struck me um, one of the things that was also recurrent in your book is precisely kind of sexual transgression and not, I mean, of ideas of what's inappropriate or what's a disciplined intimacy, right? As opposed to other forms um, of intimacy. And so some of the thing about black visual satirists is not just racism that's getting critique that I take from your book, but homophobia, but gender conformity, but you know, like all of these gender normativity, like all of these kind of other ways that the kind of layers and the cycles and the circles or since you use that phrase artistic processing, the artistic process and then the kind of um, other part of the process. And so that actually I loved about the book and as Hugh and I were chatting shortly before our event began, I talked about moments where I kept laughing, you know, it's like no one's around reading the book, laughing aloud, like, okay, well, um, and then you're like, hmm, was I supposed to laugh there? But there's this, this, there's this way in which the humor is healing, um, as you said earlier, but it's also cutting and biting in ways that I think are, are, are also useful. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is because you talk a lot about the vernacular and because the vernacular etymolo etymologically goes back to the etymology of slave, like the Vernon go goes to the low. And yet, because the book shows that the vernacular of this lineage of black visual, visual satire that all these artists are participating in is incredibly sophisticated, right? Like, is there, how do we reconcile language, right? That has this etymological baggage that implies the very opposite etymologically that in fact you're arguing and that you reveal artistically or historically uh, and through your own close readings and, and argument. I, it's not an answer I know the, it's just a question I've been wrestling with about that because I use vernacular too as a term in my work but I was just thinking. I actually want to go back to sex. And I want to say you. that that one of the components of the first chapter that I really want to thank Derek Conrad Murray on is um, his discussion of Caleb Lindsay. Uh, because Caleb Lindsay, uh, for those of you who don't know, is this performance artist who um, uses video um, and the kind of narrative of the, of the soap opera and, um, and, and Caleb takes on the, the, the mask or the identity of, of a kind of a roll call of, 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 of female personas. And some of them are, are kind of stereotypic, you know, um, the, the, the inquiring mama, the, um, the, 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 the hustling and bustling uh, uh, kind of gold digger, uh, um, the party girl. And of course, as a gay black man, uh, himself, um, it's clear that when we when we experience these stories through him, we can't help but think about uh, a kind of a, a, a queer uh, use of 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 innuendo and veiled language and and body um, movement to 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 say more than what is being said. And 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 what's interesting about Caleb's work is that on one hand, he gives us these um, melodramas, but it is really clear that, that, that he understands that, 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 how do I put it? I wanna say there's love there, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, in other words, this is not putting down um, that world and that culture as much as it's, it's saying that, that, that I take pride in the playfulness 
um, in the ironies of, 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 of how these um, how these how these relationships um, are, are are played out and and developed and and of course the other part of my my, my sex answer is that that Carol Walker you know when she creates those important works starting in the mid 1990s she understands that 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 the thing that really really makes satire work is hypocrisy or at least pointing mm -hmm. out hypocrisy. And, 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 and in order to point out hypocrisy, sex is probably one of the easiest things you can do, <laughs> or at least reference, to kind of remind people of, of the absurdity of, of people's positions, of their holier than thou kinds of uh, perspectives. And, 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 and so it's no surprise that any number of these artists, um, including Cole Scott, um, you know, uh, decides to kind of use that as a foil, including Beverly, <laughs> who, who, who in that series, you know, um, you know, plays with those ideas uh, in in very kind of layered and, and interesting ways. So, so, um, so, so, yeah. Um, sexuality is you know one of those um, elements that 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 um, thanks to um, some of our artists, it's really clear that 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 can that that we understand you know the power of that to help underscore um, critique. Thank thanks for that. Um... And I think that that goes some some way to uh, to responding to Huey's question also around um, around the idea of queering and the um, and how queering is constitutively entangled with the operations of blues, as he put it. Um, it's comments early on. Um, uh, so so thank, thanks for that. We are way past time. Um, and I mean, this is such a lovely conversation that on one level, I think, who cares? But on another level, I know people have other obligations that they have to go to. Um, um, but, um, but I just want to, um, Rick, ask you if you have any sort of closing comments that you want to make before we do close off. I mean, the, the ultimate comment is thank you. Um, you know, all of you know how challenging it is to do an academic book mm -hmm. and uh, to have like a little audience, maybe three people buy your book. <laughs> and uh, so any opportunity that you have to talk about the ideas that animated it, that inspired it, um, issues that 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 people might share with you that you feel need more development and thinking about, you know, that's 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 a gift. That sure. that's a that's a real pleasure. And so I thank um, I thank you, Beverly. I thank you, Maida. I thank you, Huey. I thank you, Ranji. I thank everybody who's connected to this um, event. Uh, and because um, it's a real gift to me. And, uh, and it just says to me that, that maybe I had something that might be of, of interest and might help people think about the artwork that, that, that surrounds us uh, and also a world that surrounds us. This is not just about art. This is about how we, we, we move and how we talk and how we communicate with one another. Uh, and uh, so, so again, my, my final words are just thank you so much for, for um, making this uh, conversation possible. Thank well, you. Thank you. I also want to say thank you for providing the occasion for this for the, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much to Meta and Huey and Beverly for um, giving such rich responses and really such an animated um, discussion. Thank you very much for our to our audience for coming along today. Also, and I hope that you can join us. Um, on April the 9th for um, for Book Watch Part 2, where there'll be a sort of deep dive into the world of Chapter 2, um, Drawing the Colour Line, The Art of Ollie Harrington, with uh, Walter Evans, um, who uh, was a friend of uh, Ollie Harrington's and his collector, and uh, Ollie Harrington's collector, um, with, um, with Rick, obviously, and with, um, with our colleague Jasmine Cobb. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I'm, you know, I wish we could raise a glass to you, <laughs> though it's, it would scandalously be in the middle of the afternoon. Um, <laughs> so and scandal is, is, is good sometimes. Um, so uh, I, I will raise a virtual glass to you, as I'm sure everyone here will, and just 
Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.